about you know what what is CP violation? What do we know? What are we going to learn? Uh, and what is going on with long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments today? Um, and you know what are some perhaps surprises there? And this is work done with uh, Rebecca on the right and Yulia on the sorry Rebecca on the left and Yulia on the right. And I should say I'm speaking from occupied Satake land. So before I get into kind of the, the latest state of the art, I just like to review a little bit on neutrino oscillations. Uh, I think this this plot here shows very nicely the history and where we are today and what is kind of the phenomena of these six oscillation parameters. So in 1998, you know, Super K saw this thing at five at 5.1 sigma, uh, which indicated the neutrino oscillations, which immediately added seven parameters to our model of particle physics, of which six of them can be probed by neutrino oscillations, which is a non-trivial statement. Uh, so since then, so, so theta 2, 3 is the mixing angle that super K, you know, is sensitive to and really new mu disappearance experiments, which is what atmospheric neutrinos predominantly are, are sensitive to. And over time, this has improved, uh, honestly, not very much, right? It's, it's improved a little bit, but many experiments are sensitive to this and it still is tough to know. It is close to maximal, which is right in the middle here. There was a brief period where we thought it might not be maximal from a, a NOVA analysis that then turned out to be perhaps a little bit uh, they had a little bit of a problem there and they corrected that and that went away. Um, but so this, this is the first thing that was measured historically, but it's something we still don't know very well. We don't know if this is maximal, if it's above maximal or below maximal. And that's called the octant question. We'd like to know that. At the same time, super K measured a frequency, of course, that dictated when these oscillations are happening in you know, L over E space, distance and energy. I think it measured super well, but many, again, many experiments are sensitive to it and it has steadily improved. In particular, we got a very robust measurement in 2012 from Dai Bay and Reno, um, and this really nailed it down. Now, there are two lines here for the best fit cases, if you look very closely. These are the normal ordering and the inverted ordering. Uh, and we don't know, you know, in some sense, which of these is correct. Uh, put another way, if we could tell if it was the higher value or the lower value, we would know the, the sign of this, whether it's positive or negative. And, and I'll talk more about this later. Now, uh, a few years later, um, in around you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, SNOW, a solar neutrino experiment, you know, uh, confirmed the solution to the solar neutrino problem is due to the neutrino oscillations and the LMA solution. Uh, and that provided a decent measurement of theta 1, 2, which with more data they improved. And then in you know, 2007 and, and on, a few years after that, CAMLAND, a reactor experiment, had an independent measurement with comparable precision. So we see the errors kind of improved. And then we kind of settled on basically the same value since then. But you'll notice that you know, solar neutrinos do a terrible job of measuring delta m squared 2, 1. Their uncertainties are still today very large, um, but reactor experiments do a great job. And then they give us a nice measurement of this. Um, although to be clear, there's only really one measurement here, which is from Camelot. So we just hope that this number is, is what we think it is. Now, as this story was developing with these four oscillation parameters, there was a sort of theoretical bias growing that perhaps theta 1, 3 should be 0. Uh, or at least very, very small. Not everyone thought this, but many people did. Um, and to that extent, to, to that end, you know, these experiments, Dai, Bay, and Reno, and, and also Double Show, uh, went out to measure, assuming that it was maybe a degree or less. Well, as we know, it's around nine degrees. So they uh, measured it very easily at very high significance. And in fact, this first measurement, you know, came with only two months of data. And of course, they continued collecting data, and we now know theta 1, 3 very, very accurately, which is nice. This brings us to the final parameter. Uh, in this story, um, which is, you know, as you can see, we, this, this here from zero to two pi is the entire physical range of delta, of course. And uh, for most of this, we had no information on it. And that's not, you know, that's not an accident because until we know all the other uh, oscillation parameters, this parameter actually isn't even physical, right? Unless we, you know, if, if theta one three ended up being zero, then delta is, the, is, is not a physical parameter. It's, it's, uh, it's irrelevant. You can, you can sort of, uh, gauge it away in a sense. Um, but now that we know that, you know, as of 2012, we knew this is non-zero. So, um, you know, now this can start taking values and from long baseline appearance measurements, which is the best way to probe it, uh, we start to get some indication and we have some information that it's probably not between zero and pi. Although that's not, you know, there, there's still some allowed values at three sigma, um, but in, in general, uh, it's probably in this upper upper region here. And of course, really, understanding what it is and nailing this number down is the goal of upcoming oscillation experiments. So uh, what is CP violation? This is something we, we sort of take for granted now. I mean, it, but at one point in time, CP violation was very shocking. 
right? People really thought that the Lagrangian of particle physics was going to be invariant under CP. Actually, I thought it was gonna be invariant under C and P. And I thought, well, maybe it'll be invariant under CP. Uh, we now know that that's not true. But, but the story I think is a little bit more subtle than that. I, I don't think we can just say, you know, CP violation is broken, so we expect it to be broken everywhere, right? There are at least three places now that we know that CP violation could appear. There could also be Majorana phases, but I'm not gonna talk about those. But without, without talking about those, there are three places. And one is in a strong interaction, right? This so-called GG dual term, which gives rise to theta bar. And you know, if, if we rescale it such that it's a number between zero and one, the data shows that it's less than 10 to the minus 11. Um, so we have, a, you know, I would say a very good measurement of this and we see no evidence for it, of course. And there's no explanation for this, right? This is, you know, this could be due to axions, but we have not seen any evidence of axions yet. Now in the quark sector, and this is where CP violation has been detected, uh, if we parameterize in terms of the Jarlskog divided by the maximum, so this is again a number between zero and one, we, we have measured it, we know what it is, uh, it is certainly there, um, but it's kind of smallish, it's not, you know, it's not like it's smaller than the uh, electron you cow or anything, but it's, you know, it's not an order one number certainly, um, so that's kind of interesting, and then of course there's the, the third place, which is in leptons. And, and we know that this can be physical, as I just mentioned, because neutrinos have mass, the masses are different, and all three mixing angles are non-zero. But at the moment, our constraints are not very good. It could be almost one. We've ruled out some of the space, but not much. Okay, so, so I think in this context, understanding CP violation uh, for neutrinos is a top priority. Uh, also, if people have questions, uh, if I'm speaking, you know, if, if they're very simple questions or very uh, uh, detailed questions, please don't hesitate to uh, put it in the chat or, or wherever and it'll be read out to me and, and please interrupt me whenever. Um, so my talk is gonna be sort of split up into two movements. Um, the first movement is just kind of some understanding of how does CP violation, you know, how should we be writing down CP violation in uh, for, for neutrinos? And the second one is going to be looking at the, the latest TDK and NOVA data. Uh, what's going on? Is there anything funny going on? And if there is, what does that, how can we understand that? What does that really mean? All right, so let's let's take a step back and think about how do we parameterize the PMNS matrix. Um, well, this is a, a three by three matrix. We're we're only going to focus on three generations here, and uh, in general, we expect it to be complex for the reasons I mentioned above. So you would think that so you know on paper it appears there's 18 degrees of freedom, but in fact, of course, there are fewer than that. Um, unitarity, the fact that the, you know probability should be conserved. Uh, provides nine constraints, so that takes us down to nine degrees of freedom. We can rephase the charged leptons, so that's, that means each charged lepton, say electron, muon, and tau, can get an arbitrary complex phase, which removes three degrees of freedom. You can do the same thing for neutrinos, which is three more degrees of freedom, but one of those is uh, linearly dependent on the three from the charged leptons. So it's only two more degrees of freedom removed for four degrees of freedom in the final answer. Now, to be clear, um, if neutrinos are Majorana, then this neutrino rephasing cannot happen. However, uh, in ultra relativistic experiments, such as you know, every neutrino oscillation experiment we've ever done or will ever do, uh, that um, you, you can't tell the difference. And so if you can do it in one case, you can do it in both cases. So you can do it in the Dirac case, so you can do it in, in the Majorana case as well. But just because we, we went from 18 parameters down to four parameters, that does not indicate how we should write it down. And there are different ways to do it, each of which are equally valid. And I'm gonna be really going into understanding what does that mean? So how have people done this in the past? Well, lots of ways, of course. Um, uh, you know, the common way, of course, the way that is, is done in practice is three rotations and a complex space on one of the rotations. And you can do this in a bunch of different ways. And I'm gonna talk in detail about that. Um, you can even do the same rotation twice. You can do a rotation across one axis, a different axis, and then the same axis again, and that will cover the space. Uh, you could instead parameterize a three by three matrix uh, as a linear combination of certain Gelman matrices or really any generators of SU3. Um, you have to pick certain ones, you, you can't do it willy nilly, but uh, you can cover the space that way as well. And people have done that. And in fact, you know, there was a time I think where people thought that might be the best way to do it. There's also the fact you can do four complex phases. There's no reason why there has to be only one number associated with you know, a complex number. And in fact, uh, Boris Kaiser, who's one of the authors here, told me that they went out to do this for the quark matrix. Of course, that's the same, you know, uh, uh, you, you do the same procedure for quarks and leptons. Um, they wanted to show that you couldn't do it because he thought there was some reason why, you know, only having complex numbers 
uh, cannot be enough to cover the space that you need to. Uh, and then they found that it didn't work. And of course, they then realized that you can write this as four complex phases. So I think that's you know a, a very um, interesting case to keep in the back of your mind that there's no fundamental reason why we need to have exactly one complex phase. There's also a perturbative description, which Wolfenstein pointed out, which is very popular for the CKM matrix. Of course, that's not so good for the for the leptons, um, which has very large mixing, but that, that is a perfectly valid parameterization as well. And clearly you could do any number of ways to turn those 18 parameters into four parameters in such a way that you cover the appropriate space. So we're gonna focus on the sequence of rotation since that's what everyone does. Uh, and, and we will show why, you know, how you can get tripped up here, but also how this is in general a good procedure. So uh, these are these rotations and I'm just gonna label them like this. Um, you know, uh, the, the one rotation is the one where the first row and the first column is uh, is the proportional of the identity and two and three and so on. I'm putting the uh, the complex phase on this uh, theta one three rotation. That doesn't matter too much. We're not gonna get too caught up on that right now. When we multiply it all out, we get this in the usual form. Um, this is what we're gonna call the PDG because this is what's in the PDG. And in terms of notation, in this notation, it's written as one, two, three. So that's easy to remember. Um, but what if we did things in a different way, right? There are you know, a, a number of different ways to write this. Um, there's six different ways uh, with, where, where there's no repeated rotations. And if we include repeated rotations, there are another six ways. So how, how does you know, this sort of, our understanding of these parameters um, change? Now, of course, the fundamental parameters change. Uh, so the, the values of them change, but the physics does not actually change. The physics is of course invariant under these transformations. And we want to be sure that our conclusions that we're drawing are not dependent on one particular choice of parameterization. But it turns out that a lot of conclusions that people discuss are dependent on the choice of parameterizations. And this is something, uh, you know, just to be aware of that, that we can get very different conclusions if we do things differently. And that's what this plot here shows, um, which is that for a given value of delta in our parameterization, let me think of it, which is what I showed in the, in the earlier, the, the first slide. Um, if I use a different parameterization, of course, it'll be a different number. Now in these blue and orange parameterizations, as you can see, it's not very different. And there's a small shift, but it's not a big deal. But in these other ones, these red, green, and purple, the shift is, the, the change is dramatic. And in fact, what you can see is that with, with no information on delta, that is if we ignore the appearance data um, from T to K and Nova, and we just say we've measured the three mixing angles. So this is where we were maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, I can already tell you what the value of the complex phase is to within 150 degrees to 210 degrees. That's, that's 30 to three precision at one sigma, um, just from measuring those three mixing angles. And of course, I've not magically learned anything or precision on the, the mixing angles in that parameterization would be worse. But this tells you that, you know, this notion of how well we know delta is very dependent on the choice of parameterization for what we mean by what delta is. Uh, and to be clear, the, the uncertainties on these oscillation parameters has a very small effect, right? That's what these bands are, is the uncertainty on the, the, the oscillation parameters. So we'll see a lot in the literature, including like the Dune TDR and, you know, snow mass reports and, and all these things, but we want to constrain, you know, 50% of all possible values of delta, right? But that's clearly a parameterization dependent thing because we've already ruled out in some parameterizations, the majority of delta space, right? So how, how does that actually work? How can you go from a case where, you know, you, you have, you put in no information about Delta and you uh, get out um, that you have information. But we decided to break it down into sine Delta and cosine Delta. And we see in cosine Delta that in these parameterizations, the, the ones that are colored, you know, red, green, and purple, which have certain, you know, combinations of the, uh, of the rotation matrices, the cosine Delta is close to negative one. I mean, that indicates something. Um, so we, uh, we, we looked at the PMNS matrix, and this is what it is in our parameterization with no information on delta. So there's delta appears in these four elements and there's some square root with something in it. What we see is that all these elements in general are fairly large in magnitude, except for this one in the corner, which as we know, this is the, what we call theta one three, um, really it's, it's sine theta one three and it's 0.15, so it's a bit small. Now in these other parameterizations, well, what happens is the location of these complicated elements, the ones with square root of a sum or a difference, appear in different locations in this matrix. In particular, in these ones, the ones that are red, green, and purple on the previous slides, 
uh, appear in this in the spot here, have a, have a complicated term like this up there. Now, th what that means is that it's, you know, something of the form square root of A plus B cosine delta. And since A and B are, you know, some functions of, in, in practice, these other, uh, these other elements, which must be sort of large-ish, in order to get them to be sort of smallish, cosine delta is gonna have to be kind of close to negative one to get a cancellage. So that's what's going on. Um, we can see this in other ways. We can see that you know you can you can translate from one parameterization to another one very simply. We worked out some nice expressions for this, and this is basically the fact that sine delta is you know is purport in one parameterization is proportional to sine delta in another parameterization uh, with some prefactor. And we calculate what these prefactors are, and you can see here that these these uh, these prefactors uh, are just some slopes, and they're just the slopes of these lines, which you can see differ from one in these other parameterizations. That's just, if you, if you want to investigate this more, you can do this fairly easily without doing all the work. Um, you can also ask about precision on delta and how that changes with different parameterizations. And that's shown here for different true values. What kind of precision do you have on delta? Well, let's suppose that we have 15 degree precision on delta in our parameterization. Again, in blue and, blue and orange, you'll have again around 15 degrees precision. But in these other cases, you'll have much more precision. In fact, in some cases, possibly as good as one degree precision. So again, this notion of 15 degrees, one degree, you know, things can change just by changing the parameterization. And, and this matters in a real sense because uh, we can look at the physics goals of the field. And this is from the snow mass process, which is, um, uh, you know, a process done in the USA about, you know, the uh, designing our, our experiments and strategizing as the field. But of course, this affects the global picture of neutrino experiments and particle physics as well, in some extent. And, and they, they say, and they use for motivation, um, you know, that the CKM angle, which is 70 degrees with around four degrees precision. So maybe we want four degrees, you know, five, five degrees uh, for our delta. But of course, this is a parameterization dependent statement. This is not a fundamental physics statement, okay? Um, so I've been harping on delta. So this means I have to provide, you know, an alternative. I can't just say what's, what's bad. I have to say what's good. And some of you probably can guess what that is. Um, but what we can do is we can say, okay, what, what is something that is, you know, physical that we measure that doesn't depend on the parameterization? And that's going to be the Yarskog invariant, of course. And, and it's, you know, it's a parameterization independent thing. And, and this is um, Cecilia Yarskog's paper from 1985. She actually had to fight pretty hard to convince people it was right, even though it's fairly easy to identify. People kept writing papers saying she was wrong. And they were all wrong. Um, and then, of course, that was focused on quarks, but the, the same is true for neutrinos. And in vacuum, at leading order, the difference between uh, in appearance mode, so this is nu mu to nu e, in neutrinos and in antineutrinos is to a pretty good approximation this quantity here. Uh, and so there's a, there's a prefactor a pi, there's this Jarl Skog invariant, and there's the ratio of delta m squared. Um, so what is measured in some sense is really just the Jarl Skog. And to get delta, you then have to put in values for every other mixing angle, okay? And in particular, this requires input from example, from solar experiments, from reactor experiments, and in, in the long baseline accelerator experiments that are measuring this like T to K and NOVA and the next generation Dune and Hyper-K, they of course don't measure these, these uh, solar parameters. They're gonna take them from other experiments, um, but instead they could just report the Jarl's hog, which is what they actually do measure. And, and the problem of course, is that if they take different values depending on if they use this global fit or that global fit or you know, the Camlan number or the, or the Juno number, which, which presumably will exist at some point, or you know, the, the best fit to solar data, you'll have different numbers here and you'll get a different value for sine delta, which can then really you know, confuse the whole picture. But the Yarlskog is, you know, is a better way. And there's a matter of fact, which plays a role for these experiments somewhat. It's, we, we've showed that this is, is easy to account for and these problems don't propagate very far. Okay, so um, so I want to start. I want to get people to start thinking about the Jarl-Skog invariant as the way to parameterize how much CP violation there is. As I said again, you know, fifty percent, you know, or seventy-five percent, or whatever of delta space is not a great thing. Precision on delta is not a great thing. And there's, there's a third statement which is also mentioned a lot, which is that if delta is pi over two or three pi over two, that that's maximal CP violation, right? But that's totally not true at all. Um, and this, this uh, figure here schematically shows that. And in fact, maximal CP violation is already ruled out at many sigma, more than 100 sigma, right? And because for maximal CP violation, you need the mixing angles to be just right. 
in addition to delta. All right, so you need theta one, two to be 45 degrees, but we know it's around 32 degrees. Okay, that's ruled out at, by my estimate, roughly 15 sigma. We need theta one, three to be this number, which is around 35 degrees. Of course, from Dye Bay and Reno, which measured this to be around eight and a half or nine degrees, that's many, it's about 100 sigma. I feel a little ridiculous writing 100 sigma since I have you know, no idea what 100 sigma means, but um, we can write that down anyway. Now, theta two, three is, as we know, close to 45 degrees. So maybe that, that is the maximal value. Well, these other two, uh, theta one, two and theta one, three, that's already, already very much uh, ruled out. So here's this, again, showing this with numbers um, and we kind of read this from left to right. CP conserving is in the middle. This would be a Jarosch Hogan variant of zero. Um, the top is plus and the bottom is minus and, and the range, the maximum values you can get from unitarity. Okay, that's this, this, uh, the, whole, the whole range of this plot here. And um, you know, so from unitarity, it can be anything, but from the measurements of snow and the confirmation from Canland of theta one, two, uh, we, we cut down the space to 91% of the space. Then from Dye Bay and Reno, of course, you know, eight and a half degrees is pretty far from 35 degrees. So that's 34% uh, of the space. And then long baseline experiments, well, they're a bit confusing as we'll see in a minute, but that rules out again, some of the values with the positive Yaroskog at some significance. So, so we've ruled out, you know, uh, about three quarters of the space. Um, we're still certainly consistent with CP conserving uh, and the data slightly prefers negative values in, in whatever sense that, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so, so we have these different uh, uh, parameterizations um, we, we have to use some parameterization. And the question is, which one is best? Um, well, of course, you can, you can define best however you want, but let's, let's make some reasonable definition here. We want to be able to write down two flavor pictures where we can. Now for long baseline appearance, which is what I've been talking about a little bit, um, there's no way to write this down in a two flavor picture, but for other experiments, you can. Solar ex experiments, it turns out, is basically just measuring UE2. A similarly long baseline reactor like Camland and Juno is also predominantly measuring UE2. So we want this thing, which is this, this factor here, which is gonna be proportional to UE2 squared. We want this to be simple and not complicated, right? And complicated means it's the sum or difference of trig functions. And the problem is that if you constrain that, you can't really constrain one parameter. Of course, our information doesn't change. Our knowledge of physics doesn't change but it's a little bit harder to represent your results in a clean way. Um, so we want UE2 to be simple, medium baseline reactor that's like Dye Bay and Reno, they're predominantly measuring UE3, and then uh, atmospheric and long baseline accelerator disappearance. So this is like super K, uh, uh, T to K, Nova, Ice Cube, uh, and Minos. They're basically measuring U mu3. And we want these three elements to be simple because it turns out that these are the ones that are easiest to measure. And okay, the parameterization we all use, one, two, three, is the only one that has that criteria, which is of course not an accident. Um, now other priorities may have different, uh, may prefer different things, but um, in general, this is a good choice. There's a reason why we do things the way we do. And I've talked about this, the order of the sequence of rotations. Um, what about the complex phase? In practice, it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, it, the, the convention that we all use for a historical reason, which isn't really valid anymore, is to put it on the one, three rotation. There are some benefits to putting it on the two, three rotation um, in that handling the matter effect is a bit easier. This doesn't actually change the value delta um, other than maybe a minus sign, depending on how you do it. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, I'm just gonna say, let's keep with the, the way everyone's been doing it. Now, before I wrap up this section, I just wanna make a, a brief comment and step into the world of quarks and say that the, the standard parameterization used for quarks is the same for neutrinos. Um, and we get these three mixing angles. We've got the Kabibo angle and then two, you know, a small angle at two degrees and a very small angle at 0.2 degrees. And this, this complex phase, which I mentioned earlier is around 70 degrees. It's in the last 10 years, it's shifted down about one degree. Um, and this looks like large CP violation. Right? 70 degrees in this context is large. Sign of this is 0.93, which is almost maximal in some sense. But as I said earlier, the, the Jaroskog is, you know, three times 10 to the minus four of the maximal value, right? So that's small, right? So, so is, is CP violation big or small? The answer is it's small, but, but this angle here will, will mislead you. And so this is a concrete example of this. And in fact, if I use a different parameterization, which let's just pick two, one, two as an example, then the complex phase is actually about one degree. Okay, so uh, clearly, you know, this notion of complex phases uh, as an indication of 
The amount of CPU violation is not a robust statement. I can, in a, in a realistic situation, go from 69 degrees to one degree just by changing the parameterization. Now, throughout all of this, I've been harping a lot on Delta uh, and saying we should be using the Jaroskog invariant, and that's completely true, but there is a caveat. I would be remiss if I did not point out that we do have to discuss Delta a little bit. And basically, the, um, the reason is because, uh, you know, given the three mixing angles and the Jaroskog, there's one piece of information that's missing about the PMNS matrix or the CTM matrix, and that is the sign of cosine Delta. You have to... This, saying this out loud sounds silly, but um, sine SIGN of cosine delta. Because if you just know the Yarls code, all you can get is sine delta, and then you, I cannot tell if cosine delta is positive or negative, and that sign is physical. You know, for example, new to new disappearance depends on this a tiny bit, and you have to know if it's positive or negative. So what does this mean? Um, well, T to K and hyper K, they basically only have sensitivity to sine delta. So, so they should report the Yarlskog. They can tell you about CP violation, but they, you know, they telling you about Delta, they, they cannot really provide a lot of information there. ANOVA and Dune, because of their higher energies and their, their larger matter effect, they have some sensitivity to cosine Delta. So it makes sense to report, of course, the Yarlskog, which tells you about CP violation, and Delta, which tells you about the parameter in the Mexican matrix. Um, and, and, and why does cosine Delta matter? Why do we care about this? Uh, this affects models. So as I said before, of course, if you only know sine delta, you don't know if cosine delta is positive or negative, but if you want to understand flavor models and why, um, you know, uh, why, why the mixing matrix is structured as it is, which is one of the, the biggest open questions in, you know, in our understanding of the standard model, pretty much all of them predict cosine delta. And you can see this in this review by, by my postdoc. Uh, you know, here's one example that, that I put together where you care about cosine delta. Uh, and here's another you know, comparison of many models. And you can see that you know, if, all, if I only knew is that the absolute value of cosine delta was say 0.3, and I couldn't tell the difference between this model golden ratio and try by maximal, uh, which have different predictions as well for the other parameters. So it really matters to know what this is. So I'm gonna briefly summarize here, which is to say that the, the complex phase in different parameterizations can be very different looking than delta in our parameterization. Um, and the narrative that we have built up and the, the intuition we have is, is completely, you know, uh, completely changes. Um, there's no maximal CP violation, Diabe, Reno, Snow, uh, they've all ruled this out at very high significance. Um, and really when you're talking about in particular CP violation, you should be talking about the Yarlskog invariant, the Yarlskog coefficient. Um, and, and, you know, but then we have to, we do have to make some choice about the parameterization and the one we use is good and we, we use it for a reason. All right, um, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and move to the second phase of my talk, um, which is about TDK and NOVA. And um, they presented this plot at uh, the last neutrino conference. Of course, we're coming up on the next one now in a, in a month or two in Korea, and I hope people tune in for that. But we see this and, you know, it, it, it looks kind of interesting, right? So T to K prefers the region shown in black, NOVA prefers the region shown in blue. And these are these fundamental parameters, delta and theta two, three, from now on, I'm just fixing us to the usual parameterization and the usual definition of delta. Um, and, uh, you know, T to K wants to be at around three pi over two, and maybe an upper, the upper octant for theta two, three. Um, Nova doesn't really care about delta or the octant, except the one thing they are, they do seem to think they know, is that it's not at delta of three pi over two and the upper octant. Okay, now the significance is clearly not very large, things overlap a lot, but uh, let's pretend that this is that this is a real thing. Um, now, before I do that, I have to explain the mass ordering. And this is the one parameter or the one, the one thing in neutrino oscillations that I have not discussed yet. But this is actually really important, not just because we have to measure, we have to measure all the parameters in our model, and that is our jobs as physicists, but it also has important implications for other measurements that people are trying to do. In particular, cosmology, they're measuring the sum of the neutrino masses with very good precision, and the story plays out differently in the normal and inverted orderings. Neutrinos still have beta decay. Uh, it is easier to probe if the mass ordering is inverted than normal. Uh, it does affect tritium endpoint experiments, such as Catrin, although Catrin is not sensitive enough to do this uh, in all likelihood. And uh, the cosmic neutrino background, if we ever measure that, there's potentially a significant impact depending on the mass ordering. So what is the status of the mass ordering today? It's actually pretty complicated. 
So individually, NOVA and TDK, uh, which both have some sensitivity at the maybe one and a half to two sigma level, they both prefer the normal mass ordering over the inverted ordering individually. But when combined, they prefer the inverted ordering over the normal ordering. And this is a, it's a surprising thing, and it has to do with the, the last slide. It's because they prefer different values of delta that can be resolved by flipping the mass ordering. Now, super K has some sensitivity in their atmospheric data. It's a little bit complicated, but they do have some, and they prefer the normal ordering over the inverted ordering. So when you combine, you know, points one, two, and three, even though, you know, Nova and T to K together prefer the inverted ordering, super K prefers the normal ordering more. So the combination prefers the normal order. Now you get some information from Diabe and Reno because they measure the same delta M squared in a different way. And if you combine that, you can get some information at around the one signal level. And that also slightly tends towards the normal ordering, um, but that's not enough to really uh, change this narrative. So all in all, the, the sensitivity is at the maybe two to three signal level, depending on who you ask. Um, one can also ask the question, about the mass ordering and is it robust? So, so let's imagine that we measured it uh, very well and all of our oscillation experiments agreed, right? So we had TDK, NOVA agreed, super K atmospheric agreed. We had, um, uh, you know, Dune, we had Juno, we had everybody all agreeing. The problem is that I can, if we care about new physics and that's what I'm gonna be talking about, um, you cannot determine the mass ordering uh, in the presence of, um, uh, uh, new physics. And, and what that looks like is this. So if you have, for example, the normal ordering measured with no new physics and epsilon here is some parameter that just parameterizes the size of this new physics, that is exactly equivalent, exactly equivalent in oscillations to the inverted ordering plus some amount of new physics for some parameter of negative two. It also works the other way around. Okay. So it doesn't matter how good of an oscillation experiment you do, you cannot tell if the mass ordering is normal or inverted, and that will affect things for cosmology. So perhaps if cosmology and oscillations disagree, maybe we'll have to take a look and see, can we probe, can we understand if epsilon EE is equal to negative two or not? Negative two. This is known as LMA dart. Um, and, and this can be broken, right? You can determine if there's epsilon EE of negative two by looking at scattering experiments. So the same process that would affect them, the oscillation experiments would also affect uh, scattering, and this is a paper which uh, actually just appeared, it says to appear, but it just appeared a few days ago. But basically, um, the problem is that scattering is only sensitive to new physics heavier than a certain scale. Um, so, you know, older experiments like Charm and Newtab ruled out this epsilon EE of negative two for sufficiently heavy mediators, more than around 10 GeV. Coherent, uh, a, a recent experiment that measured the sevens process, coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering, ruled this out for mediators heavier than around 50 MeV. And then also cosmology, we showed rules uh, this out for light mediators. So if you have things that are too light, uh, then that, that'll mess up BBN and the CMB. But that leaves a small window there. And we recently showed that data from a reactor experiment rules this out for any mediator mass, but there are still some ways in the flavor structure to rule to, to get around this which I would say this is just an ongoing, ongoing direction. So it is still possible that the mass ordering might not be robust, but it requires increasingly precise uh, values of new physics. All right, now I'm gonna go back to TDK and NOVA. As I said, I'm motivating this by the fact that they seem to disagree. The significances are not very high, um, but it's, it still is, I think, a very valuable exercise uh, to, to address this for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, if they continue to disagree, um, you know, what, what kinds of things are, are we looking at and can we resolve this with new physics? And in particular, um, if we do resolve it with new physics, what other experiments can rule this out or confirm it? And, and this applies both to Nova and TDK as well as the next generation experiments, Dune and HyperK. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide. So, so what kind of new physics can do this? Um, well, there's, there's a number of things that we talk about in neutrino oscillations, and this is a, an incomplete list. I apologize if your favorite uh, scenario is not, not listed here. Um, but one obvious thing is sterile neutrinos, um, neutrino decay, a neutrino decoherence. If they're decohering faster than we expect, um, that'll change the oscillation probabilities. What if neutrinos are interacting with the dark matter and that modifies uh, their field, uh, the, the, the parameters in a non-trivial way? You can also look at Lorentz invariance violation or CPT violation. You can do a, a more agnostic approach than sterile neutrinos and look at unitary violation. Um, and these have been, some of these have been looked at by a few people in the context of this tension. Uh, it turns out none of those work um, in data. Uh, the one that, that does work, the one that I'm going to be presenting today, is non-standard interactions 
with a complex CP violating phase. And I'll explain what that means, but the, the basic story is that NSI is like a matter effect, but with more flavor information. And in particular, because T decays at lower energies, they're at about a half a GeV, while uh, uh, Nova is at higher energies, uh, one and a half to two GeV, um, this leads to different matter effects. And because of that, NSI will manifest differently. So that's well, something different in different experiments. So this will, will do that. Uh, it's been known theoretically from understanding of neutrino oscillation probabilities that new complex NSI phases are somewhat degenerate with the standard phase. So we're gonna want a complex phase to move delta around between the two experiments. And how you should think of this is that since TDK is closer to vacuum, they basically are measuring the vacuum parameters and NOVA is measuring some combination of the vacuum parameters and the NSI parameters. It's not exact, but it's a good picture. So if you don't know about NSIs, this is my one slide review um, of this. NSIs is an EFT framework. So it's a, we're right down to dimension six operator where we got some neutrinos with some flavor structure uh, interacting with some fermions. And we mainly are thinking about you know, matter for men. So electrons, up quarks and down quarks. And then we've got, we parameterize it in this perhaps somewhat unusual way with these epsilons. And these epsilons are proportional to G Fermi. So this is how much bigger or smaller things are compared to the, um, the standard model uh, of matter potential. Now it's a little bit difficult to construct a viable model that, you know, uh, that gives rise to this, this operator, but it can be done. And there's many papers that do this. And there's actually some more since then that I, I haven't included here. And the point is, to relate some, you know, some Lagrangian with some that, that'll affect scattering to oscillations in a relatively model independent way, or at least as, as model independent as you can get. And, and the point is that these epsilons can then be recast and put in, in the Hamiltonian for oscillations. So this is the, the, the usual Hamiltonian. We've got the vacuum term here, the, the mixing matrix, the, uh, the, the mass squares, and then the mixing matrix again, and then A is the matter potential, and this one is the standard model term, and these epsilons are all the new physics terms. Now, there are a lot of NSI parameters. Um, you know, depending on how you break it down, you can have different flavors, different couplings to matter fermions. You can have different chiral structures. You, in general, you can actually have hundreds of different NSI parameters. Obviously, that's ridiculous. Our data is not very good. We can barely measure the uh, three flavor oscillation parameters. There's no way to constrain 270 parameters. So we're gonna break it down to just a couple of parameters. And we're gonna focus on off diagonal with complex phases and just do uh, one of these three at a time. So two parameters at a time, the magnitude and the phase. Epsilon e mu, epsilon e tau, and epsilon e tau. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. So we can approximate the size of this effect before we look at the data. We're gonna make this ansatz, or these two ansatzes, that, that you know anything, if two experiments are measuring different things, it's because of NSI and not because of something else. And we're gonna assume that NSI mainly modifies delta. In practice, it modifies everything, but the impact of some parameters is bigger than others. And so we make this thing, we say, well, the, the, what's going on, on the left is the reality, right? There is some new physics and there's some true value delta. But experiments, of course, they do things assuming a regular three flavor picture and they get, you know, they extract some measured value of delta. Um, and, and we're gonna say that these should be the same. And you do this for neutrino mode and anti-neutrino mode. And you do this for multiple experiments, T to K and Nova. And you combine them and you see what you get. And what we did is we showed that to a good approximation, the magnitude of this new physics, whether it's epsilon e mu or epsilon e tau, is some prefactor, and W beta is just uh, you know different octants, um, whether it's e mu or e tau, and then you know, and then this term here, and this term really contains all the physics. The numerator is how what they measured is different. So sine delta t to k is what t to k thinks they measured, and sine delta nova is what nova thinks they measured, and then the denominator is the matter potential. So this is how the experiments are different, right? Nova is in a higher matter potential than T to K. And so, you know, that indicates why what they measure is different. And if you plug in the numbers, you get around 0.2. And you can check this equation, you know, roughly makes sense. You can also estimate the phase and you find, and, and the, the details are, are, are a bit subtle, but basically that the true value of delta is basically what T to K measures, which is, as we saw earlier, around three pi over two. And you can check and you'll find that the new complex phase of the new interactions is gonna end up being roughly the same thing as what we, we expect. I'll skip this as well um, and jump you know, right to the numerical analysis. So this is the, you know, the results, this is what we all wanna know. And to do this, we actually have to do a fit to, to a couple of experiments. Um, so, so we use you know, NOVA and TDK, we use their appearance data and these are approximately single bin measurements. They don't really have a lot of spectral information and that's by design. 
Um, and we approximate them in this way where X, Y, and Z are some numbers that encompass, you know, Z is the background rate, X is a combination of the flux detector volume efficiencies and cross sections, and then Y is the wrong sign lepton contribution for, for a neutrino mode. So in neutrino mode, there are some antineutrinos produced. The far detectors cannot differentiate between neutrinos and antineutrinos, so you have to include that. In neutrino mode, it's not that important, but in anti-neutrino mode, it's quite important because the neutrino cross-section is larger and also the intrinsic uh, anti-neutrino rate is, sorry, the intrinsic neutrino rate in the anti-neutrino mode is larger than the other way around. So you have to include this. We can then we parameterize the input from the disappearance, um, which, you know, there's, there's some details from this that the results don't matter on how this is done too much, which is good because the experiments make it a bit difficult to extract this information, but the information is there anyway. We then plug in the standard uh, experimental parameters. So NOVA is at close to 2 GeV, slightly more density because it's going deeper into the crust and the crust density increases as you go down. And the baseline is of course a, a factor of you know, two and a half times large, longer, which is why the energy is two and a half times higher. So they're both at the oscillation maximum and T to K is lower energy and shorter baseline. Now to do um, a fit with appearance data, you need all six oscillation parameters. And of course, there's information about delta, which is what we're really paying attention to, as well as theta 2, 3, and delta n squared 3, 1. But you also need theta 1, 3, theta uh, 1, 2, and delta m squared 2, 1. And you have to be careful about where this information comes from. If you use global fits, you'll get theta 1, 3 that includes information from t to k. So you'll double count. You can't do that. So what we did was we used dia bay for theta 1, 3. We also took you know, additional information on delta m squared 3, 2, and this is in vacuum, so NSIs won't affect this. And then for the solar parameters, we use CAMLAND, which gives us theta 1, 2 and delta m squared 2, 1. And again, CAMLAND is also in vacuum or almost in vacuum, so um, NSIs doesn't affect this either. Now, we also have, now the, the problem is CAMLAND does not tell us what delta m squared 2, 1 is positive or negative. We need solar data from that. And of course, Snow famously told us that delta m squared 2, 1 is positive, because the appearance probability, sorry, the disappearance probability decreases at higher energies instead of increases, right? That's because they saw uh, uh, an electron neutrino rate of about a third and not two thirds. Um, now, this result depends on non-standard interactions, right? So non-standard interactions would change this story. Turns out uh, it's, it, it doesn't cause, it, the, the parameters we're considering here doesn't cause a problem here, so this is fine. But you have to check this kind of thing when you're, when you're doing these analyses. So before I get to the new physics, of course, I'll, I'll hold off the best for last. I'm going to say a few words about the standard oscillation parameters. And I'm presenting this in terms of the Yarlskog invariant, because of course I've emphasized that that's important. Um, and on the x-axis, we have the Yarlskog invariant. The middle is CP conserving. Anything away from the middle is CP violation. And the y-axis is theta 2, 3. The middle is maximal mixing. The upper is the upper octant. The bottom is the lower octant. And T to K kind of, as we saw before, prefers and this is our fit, which is, is quite consistent with the experiment's fit, prefers negative values of uh, the Yarlskog invariant and the upper octant. Nova is pretty much okay with anything except for where TDK is. And we see that the combined fit shown in orange is a bit bigger than the TDK region, which is not surprising. We switch to the inverted ordering, things do tend to agree better because uh, Nova prefers negative values of the Yarlskog as does TDK. So you can kind of get a handle here for why um, the, the combined fit prefers the inverted ordering because there's not this slight tension in, in the amount of CP violation. Of course, the significance there is not very high. So now we plug in the new physics and uh, this is what we get. So these are our results. Um, so the x-axis is the magnitude of this parameter. So the, the left side at zero is the standard model. Uh, and then the y-axis is the complex phase. So zero and pi and two pi are uh, if the NSI is real. Um, and this is epsilon mu and epsilon e tau. We're gonna focus on epsilon e mu. We see we get a preferred region here at uh, a complex phase. And, and something to note is if you only did an analysis with real NSI, you would totally miss this, right? You would see a slight preference, you know, here-ish, but you would miss a better fit up there. Um, the orange regions are preferred at in increasing units of delta chi squared, and the dark gray regions are disfavored at 90% confidence level. And I've also drawn on here the ice cube region. So ice cube uh, in their atmospheric neutrinos also has sensitivity to these same NSI parameters. And they disfavor anything to the right at 90% uh, confidence level. So they disfavor the best fit point, but you know, I mean, in, in any you know, joint fit, which is including ice cube is a, is a bit tricky, but uh, certainly, certainly possible to be done in the future. 
this is not exactly ruled out. I mean, you know, you, you would expect a, a preferred region actually just a little bit lower, but in general, things would be relatively compatible. More importantly, we see that ice cube sensitivity is right at the same level here. So ice cube is a great way to, to understand this. Um, we can recheck those, uh, these are the, the actual numbers if you care about the details. We can recheck our analytic approximations, which were around 0.2 in a complex, a new complex phase of 3 pi over 2 and a, you know, the standard complex phase of 3 pi over 2. And in, in these scenarios, epsilon e nu and epsilon e tau, we find that the values are quite close to what we predicted around 0.2 and, and a little closer to 0.3. Complex phases of 1.5 and 1.6, so again, very close. And again, the value delta is very close. Um, so um, before I wrap up, I just want to say, uh, where can we test this? We know in neutrino physics, we have a sort of a history of perhaps finding anomalies that we then can struggle to confirm or refute. And um, this is not one of them. Uh, now this anomaly is, is much less significant than others in the past, but this is something we can understand. And the reason is because um, the, the ways to probe these epsilon e mu and epsilon e tau parameters are long baseline, but also atmospheric. And as we saw, they're both fairly similar. This is ice cubes plot of in the same thing. Again, this, this dashed curve is the one that I showed before. And they, you know, they actually have a best fit value in a kind of a similar region. If I'm to put on my tinfoil hat, I believe that this is a real thing. Um, this is even less significant than the other not very significant things, but they've got a lot more data in the bank, which might be presented in the next few months. We'll see if they can complete that analysis in time. It'll be very interesting, right? Because they can rule this out or see it. And, and the, the nice thing is that the systematics between ice cube and uh, TDK and Nova are completely different. The fluxes are different, the cross sections are different, um, and the oscillation physics is different. So it's very unlikely to have any kind of systematic problem. Uh, SuperK also does this. Their sensitivity is about the same, um, and they, you know, they're basically, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to accumulate more data. That's not going to really change their answer. Um, you can also probe this with scattering experiment, as I mentioned earlier, which is coherent. Uh, and the constraints are the same order of magnitude, but it's model dependent. So you can always change the scattering experiments to get around this if you want to in a very reasonable way. So with that, I will uh, summarize and get to the end and, and just review again what I said. In the first half of my talk, I mentioned uh, parameterizations and you know you have to be a little careful about it. Um, and, and really we should, you know, experiments and theorists should both be presenting and discussing things when we're talking about CP violation in terms of Cecilia Jarlskog's invariant. Um, then as for Nova and T decay, the story, you know, is, is a little interesting um, and I think a little bit complicated um, and that we've got this Nova and T decay tension. Uh, they both prefer the normal ordering, but together they prefer the inverter ordering. This improves the goodness of fit a little bit, but not much, but the, the, the goodness of fit can be very much improved and the tension is fully resolved in the presence of new physics. All those other um, new physics scenarios like sterols and neutrino decay and so on don't explain the tension. Uh, you can approximate it analytically, so you don't even have to do a fit. You can just plug it in, see what kinds of new physics you would need, and then go and check and see if it's ruled out by another experiment. Um, and I think what's really cool about this is that if this ends up being right, which, you know, who knows, um, that this new physics would introduce yet another source of CP violation and really would muddy the puzzle about what is going on with CP violation even further. Hasn't been ruled out by other things, but it will be tested soon by them, such as ice cube and coherent. Um, so obviously we should all be paying attention and uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for the nice and super interesting webinar. The, I like it a lot. So let's start with some question from the, I mean, for the people that is following the live transmission in YouTube, you can write a question in the, in the chat. So later we can refer the question to Peter, but, but to give you time to, to do that, maybe we can start with some question from here from the people that is attending the, the Zoom session. So I don't know if some of you guys have some question for, for Peter. Yeah, I, I could ask well, a please. couple, thanks. Um, so thank you for the talk, it was, it was very nice. Um, I was wondering about, so, so wondering about the first part of your talk where you looked at the different parameterizations. And I was wondering if you had a look at what happens if um, you uh, take into account also the mass ordering, right? Because if you have the mass ordering, the normal ordering, right? Okay, it's normal order, no problem. But if you have inverted ordering, 
right? The M3 should be, you know, switched to the, to the lightest value as, as in the quarks and the leptons, right? That the lightest one is, is number one. And that will rearrange your, your, your PMNS matrix. So I don't know if you had a look. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so for the PMNS matrix, it doesn't care about the mass ordering. Right. I mean, I can write down. Right, so let's let's go. I, I wrote down the Hamiltonian for oscillation somewhere, uh, like right here. I mean, obviously, let's ignore the NSI, but we've got some mixing matrix and some mass and some mixing matrix. And this, the elements in this M squared can be ordered in whatever way you want. Right. You can order them in some. And, and this is something I didn't talk about, and maybe I should have. Um, and this will hopefully encourage me to do a better job in the future. But uh, this, you know. You can write this down in whatever order you want. Now, naively, you would think yeah. from quarks that you should write them in increasing order. And actually, for neutrinos today, that's not a good idea because we don't know that, as you as you point out. We know the electron neutrino fraction, and that's how I choose to define them by increasing, sorry, by decreasing electron neutrino fraction. Um, if you want to re uh, reorder that, that's fine. Of course, you can do that. You can, you know, let's say that the mass ordering is inverted. And uh, let's say we want to write them such that M1 is less than M2 is less than M3, which is a very reasonable thing to do if we knew that if we knew the mass ordering with any confidence. Yeah. And um, then that would, would cause a reorder. That, however, does not significantly change this parameterization discussion. Um, the reason is because I don't really have a good plot for that, but basically all you're doing is just redefining which one is which. Um, and and you're, you're just shuffling the columns around, right? And so nothing really changes here. Um, you may want to choose a different parameterization. That might be true. But uh, if, you, if you choose to, if, if the mass order is inverted and you choose to order the masses in increasing value, um, we may want to reevaluate how we do this, but um, that, that's, that's just, a, I, I think that's just changing the, in, the order of the indices here. Um, but yeah, but I think that's definitely a good point. And that's something um, to think about if the mass ordering ends up being inverted uh, as a field. I think separately from that, we're, we're going to want to reevaluate how do we define M1, M2, and M3. And I'm sure I can guarantee you right now that if that happens, there will be a big split in the field. And some people will say we should order them in increasing masses because now we know what they are and that's what we should do. Mm -hmm. And some people will say we should keep it the same way because otherwise everyone will be confused and do things wrong. Mm -hmm. And then this will cause even more confusion and even more things will be done wrong. Um, yeah. That's, that's a very okay. good point. Thanks. Can I make another one, another question? Please, so yeah. You, you showed that Jarl Scott parameter in the standard parameterization in your other parameterizations, ah. does it change its, its shape? Uh, yes, it does, great question. Um, I did not write it down. I was not very comprehensive there, but yeah. So, so this is what it is in our parameterization, okay? Um, assuming we're just talking about three rotations in a complex phase, it's always gonna be sine delta, right? If delta is zero or pi, then then the matrix is real and therefore there is no CP violation. So it has to be sine delta. You see it is sine and cosine of every mixing angle, except mm -hmm. for theta one three, which there's an extra cosine. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to see this. And this has you know, been discussed a lot in the literature, um, but it's the, it's the middle rotation is what it is. So uh, if we go to one of these other parameterizations, you know, like one, two, one, two, three is what we have. But if we do one, three, two, then the middle rotation is three, which is the one, two. So then what you'll have is of course all the, the angles will be different, right? But also the expression will be different in that the, the, the one that has an extra cosine is not theta one three, it is theta one two. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's whatever's the middle rotation. Um, uh, you know, it, depending on the order here, it's, it's different. So that's the only thing that changes. Um, oh, really? And, 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 the, and the, is it still the sign of, of whatever phase you have? Yes, exactly. It's still a sign of the oh, complex, okay. of the new complex phase, sign, I mean, okay. delta prime or whatever. And of course, all these angles are now new angles that don't, okay. you know, the, the yeah. new theta two, three is no longer 45 degrees or it's whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, but yeah, so it's just this, the square changes, you know, this, this extra factor of C13, you know, what might be C12 or whatever. Yeah, but that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And so it's one, it's one, yeah, so when we're actually calculating what we do is we say that the Jarl's Scott invariant is the same in different parameterizations. We then calculate it one way and the other way, and then we match them onto each other in addition to some other matchings. And that's how you, you do it numerically. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, we, we have, I mean, if there is somebody here that wants to ask it, but we have a three questions from the, from the YouTube audience. So the first one is from Adrian Thompson. 
uh, he asked, uh, does the Jarkov remain robust if we add the fourth neutrino into the mix? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is no. Um, in the presence of four neutrinos, right? So, so yeah, so let's go back to, this, this is a very good question. So everything was assuming relatively vanilla stuff here for a reason. So this, you know, three by three, we end up with four degrees of freedom. Um, as, as you may know, if, with an extra neutrino, uh, there are three new degrees of freedom. Okay, so now up to seven. And the, the way it's usually parameterized is instead of three rotations with one complex phase, it is uh, five rotations and three complex phases. So we, we end up with two new angles, sorry, three new angles, six rotations, and three new angles and uh, two new complex phases. Um, so sorry, it is, yes, uh, eight, eight parameters. Um, and, and you can check by unitarity and, and field re, uh, invariance, you, you can check that that's correct. Um, there are not, people have shown that there is no longer a single useful Jarlowskog invariant, there are multiple ones. And the reason can be seen in a couple of different ways. One is from looking at the PMNS matrix and unitarity. The other way is to look at this. So this, you know, I, I swept a lot of things under the rug here, but what's really going on is that in three flavors, there are the CP conserving terms, which look like sine squared, delta M squared, L over 4E, and there's three of those for each of the, the three delta M squareds. And there's one term, which is a triple sine term. It's the product of, you know, sine of delta M squared L over 4E for the three different delta M squareds, okay? And that's, and then you, you make some approximations and you get this expression here, um, which is very nice and simple. But if you have four neutrinos, that doesn't work anymore. Um, it, the, the CP violating term in the vacuum appearance probability is much more complicated and the prefactors, and it, so, so it turns out that the prefactors for all three terms here end up being the same. And that's why it's the Jarlskog invariant and that's what's so elegant about this. In the other case, they're not the same. Um, there are a couple of different Jarlskog invariants. So uh, in that case, I would say you definitely need to use the complex phases. And so it's usually parameterized like delta one three, delta one four and delta two four or something like that. And I think in that case, there's no way around the fact if you're doing uh, a study with sterile neutrinos in an appearance uh, experiment, you know, Dune, Hyper-K or whatever, um, you really have to do, it's, it's a much more complicated scenario. And the reason why this works out so elegantly, right? You, you can ask them, why is it so like simple and pretty in this case? And the reason of course is because three is the minimal number of generations to have CP violation, right? With two, as we know, you cannot have CP violation of any kind. Three generations, you can, um, you know, and, and, but, but there's only really one way to have it, whether it's just, whether you say that's one complex phase, which I would say is not a good way to say it, because of course I can write the, the PMNS matrix or the CK matrix with four complex phases, but a true statement is that there is one relevant CP violating uh, invariant, which is the Jarlskog invariant. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, well, Adrian can he can write in the in the chat if he has further question. But let's give another question from the chat. Is from Orlando Perez. He's asking, uh, what happens if you have only NSI in production and detection? Can you explain the difference between T2K and Nova? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't know. Um, so, so Orlando's asking about charged current NSI, which modifies the production. So the production is from pi NDKs predominantly, and the detection is from you know, charged current processes, which uh, in principle are related, but not the same. Um, and there's been some studies recently, you know, really going into how those two are related and how you can't do anything willy nilly, which is what people have done in the past. Um, I would say we, th there's a reason we didn't look at, well, I say there's, there's a, well, so, so charge current NSI will, will also depend on energy. So you'll get things being different for NOVA and TDK, which is good. Um, the problem, of course, that anyone who, who works with charge current NSI knows is that, you know, I, I had this uh, slide here where I alluded to the fact that building models uh, with large NSIs is difficult. But here I was just focusing on neutral current NSI, which I didn't, I didn't say that, but it, it is. Um, it is doable. With charge current NSIs, it's extremely difficult uh, to evade other constraints. And I would say um, that is the first thing to keep in mind. That said, if you don't care about those constraints, which I don't know if they can be evaded in any realistic model, um, if you don't care about them, which is fine, um, then you know, probably 
You can probably explain this TDK Nova thing like that. Uh, I don't know if anyone has looked at it though. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, maybe Orlando may also one sure. comment. You can write in the in the chat. But in the meanwhile, I don't know if there are other questions from the if Walter or Nicolas has questions to to address to to Peter. Otherwise, we can. There is a still an, another one in, in YouTube. This is from uh, Jorge Diaz. He's. I'm gonna read all the the the. There are two questions more or less. Uh, CP violation in neutrinos is brought up as a way to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry. What value of delta is needed for, for this or mm -hmm. any non-zero value will do? If so, how small is needed? I mean, if you can comment on, on that. Yeah, um, that's, that's a, a great question. It's a topic that comes up a lot. Um, you know, people, when they motivate CP violation in neutrinos, they often say, you know, Baryon asymmetry of the universe, Sakharov conditions, therefore this. And I, I did not say that. And, and that was not an accident. So I very much appreciate getting the question. Um, I, I presented CP violation and motivated it this way, which I hope is motivated. I mean, of course, we can all care about whatever we want to care about. I think this is a very interesting story. Um, Baryon asymmetry of the universe is as interesting or more interesting story. And from Sakharov conditions, under relatively general, though not completely general scenarios, we need CP violation. This thing from uh, quarks, the three times 10 to the minus four is too small to do anything. This of course could have done something, but it's way too small. And so people pointed out, you can get, uh, you know, lepton asymmetry from, um, from the leptonic sector. And then from the Spalon process, which converts basically particle number to particle number, uh, you can convert that to baryons and people have shown that that can work. Um, however, it turns out that there is nothing, and this is this is the, the really the, the full answer, and I'll go into more detail in a second, but there is nothing that we can measure in any neutrino oscillation experiment that can tell us if leptogenesis either is or is not the cause of the baryonic symmetry of the universe, right? We can measure delta or the Arlskog, the PMNS matrix, if you prefer, to be zero with arbitrarily good precision, or we can measure it to be one or negative one or a half or negative a half, and Maybe, neut maybe neutrinos are explained by asymmetry, maybe they don't, but it does not tell us one way or another. And I can give, I can give an example of this. Um, there's a paper by Jessica Turner and collaborators a couple of years ago uh, investigating this and they developed a model. So this is a model specific statement where they have uh, neutrinos causing leptogenesis and thus baryogenesis and they get the right baryon asymmetry. How it works, however, is we, via the seesaw. And basically the problem is that for the neutrino masses, the temperature at which some CP violating process would happen, uh, it doesn't work, right? It has to, you can't, you don't need just CP violation. It has to be out of thermal equilibrium. So it has to happen during a first order phase transition for neutrinos and the masses that we know that they have around 0.1 EV or so, it doesn't happen. Um, but if you have a new sector, you know, of course you can do things willy nilly. And, you know, let's say you have some heavy neutrinos with some mass, you know, well beyond uh, the TEV scale, uh, you can do this and that's fine. Um, you can then choose to relate those parameters to the parameters down here and say there's some symmetry that relates them, fine. Of course, there's no way to test that since we cannot measure things well beyond the LHC. Um, so we would never know if that symmetry is there. Moreover, um, in that relationship that they chose, so even if you believe their model, even if you know the scale at which it happens, uh, the, the problem is that while, while there is a connection to Delta in that specific model, it depends on the scale of the new physics. It also depends on both the Majorana phases, right? So even in a very specific scenario, you can't get around the fact that there are three complex phases on the low energy side. We can measure one of them from oscillations, which we presumably will in upcoming experiments. Um, there are two more associated with Majorana phases. Now, if we measure neutrino with double beta decay, we measure with arbitrary precision, and we get the nuclear matrix elements down, which you know it may be extremely challenging, but let's say we do that, that gives us one bit of information, which tells us the absolute neutrino mass field. If we then measure cosmology arbitrarily precisely, which is extremely difficult and extremely unlikely in my opinion, um, we then get one more piece of information, which tells us one more of the monoron phases, which tells us one of the two monoron phases. But the second one is impossible to probe in any experimental configuration. And even in a very specific model where everything was working out just right, uh, you still cannot tell what both monoron phases are, which means that I can always sort of change um, the, the delta that we're measuring and the, the other Majorana phases and cancel them out. They're basically fully degenerate with each other, even in a specific model. And of course, the model could be any old thing and it could be, you know, and the, the scale of the new physics could be at 
you know, a thousand TV at a million TV or whatever, in which case that changes the amount of CP violation you need. So there, it's, it's the, the connection between neutrino oscillation experiments and baryon asymmetry of the universe is extremely tenuous um, and not something to take very seriously. Hopefully that's not too harsh, but I think that's correct. <laughs> no, it's okay. So uh, I don't know if there are the last question because we are, we are already on the time. So maybe, okay. So first of all, we thank Peter for the very nice webinar. I like it a lot. And for the people that is following the transmission, we meet more or less in two weeks from now for another Latin American webinar of physics. And of course, take care all of you and see you in the next time and keep in touch. Thank you, Roberto, and thank you to the uh, the law group for, for inviting me. Cheers. Okay, we are out of